Um, so this time we're going to be talking about learning from and for knowledge bases. And oops. Knowledge bases are basically structured databases of knowledge, and they can take any form that you want. Uh, very often when we talk about knowledge bases in NLP, we're talking about a very specific form of structured knowledge, uh, specifically entities, uh, which form nodes in a graph, and relations, which form the edges between nodes. We can express a very broad variety of knowledge just in this graph structure, but you can also do other, uh, you know, use other structures as well. But mostly this time I'm going to be talking about things that appear in this structure. And within this general kind of application area of NLP or, you know, modeling area of NLP, uh, there's a number of questions that we might want to be answering. The first one is how can we learn to create or expand knowledge bases using, um, you know, NLP models or specifically neural models of NLP? And the second question is how can we learn from the information that's included in knowledge bases and use that to improve our uh, neural representations? And also, how can we use um, structured knowledge to answer questions? And we're going to be talking about this here, and then we're also probably going to be talking about it during the semantic parsing class that Bob is going to be doing in a, a few lectures. Um, one other thing I should mention is this is the last lecture I'm doing for a while, and then Bob will be doing four in a row uh, after this uh, uh, analysis. But uh, this time I'll be talking more on the application area whereas Bob will be talking more on like the syntactic or semantic analysis, uh, like lower level here. So types of knowledge bases, uh, this is just an introduction of uh, some of the things that are out there. And there's lots of different types of knowledge bases. One of the most famous kind of canonical ones that uh, people used very profusely a long time ago and still use somewhat today is WordNet. And WordNet is essentially a large database of words, including parts of speech and semantic relations between them. Uh, to give some examples of the relations that are stored in WordNet, we have things like is a relations. And the example of this would be uh, an SUV, uh, sorry, uh, hatchback is a type of car or, um, you know, a an electric vehicle is a type of car. It also has part of relations like wheel and car. Uh, so a wheel is uh, you know, a part of a car. And there's also kind of a type and in instance distinction where a type, you know, a hatchback is a type of car, but my car is an instance of a car. Or um, you know, Graham is an instance of a professor. Graham Newbig is an in instance of a professor, for example. So it's whether there's one or whether there's uh, there's many of them. It also includes verb relations. Uh, and verb relations are ordered mostly by specificity. So communicate is uh, kind of a super class of talk, which is also a super class of whisper. So it gives you the, these kinds of information. Um, it also gives you adjective relations like uh, antonyms. So wet is the opposite of dry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this was very widely used, uh, you know, for a while until like at least the mid 2010s. Uh, does anyone have an idea why we don't use that quite as much anymore? Yeah. Storage. Storage. Like this could have been grown out of scale and updating it over and over again. Uh, so updating it over and over again, what, what's the problem with that? Like adding more and more words to the dictionary itself would make it infeasible to use it. Yeah, so adding more and more words to the dictionary would make it infeasible to use. Yeah, that, so that's a good point. Um, so we have new words all the time. We have uh, various uh, issues with um, like updating it and keeping it current. And one of the interesting things is 
We definitely know that that's a problem because on the WordNet site, they basically say due to funding and staffing issues, we are no longer to, able to accept comments and suggestions. So it's obvious, like the WordNet people are telling us, you know, that this was a problem to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's another reason that people can think of? We got one in the chat. Okay. Um, most real life data is not available there, like domain specific data uh, in the chat. That's a good point too. Um, although there were efforts to make like bio, biology word nets and you know these sorts of structured databases in other uh, other domains as well. Any any other ideas? As a hint, um, like, can anybody think of a different way that we would be able to capture these sorts of relations? Learn yep. activities or neural nets. Yeah, learn it with a deep neural net or learn it with a word embedding, actually. So I think word nets started to fall out of favor when we started getting things like word to vec and other things, because, um, you know, word to vec, to some extent, anyway, it's not perfect. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, uh, can capture things like is a uh, relations and um, other things like this. Uh, however, there are things that word, net can, uh, word to vec cannot capture super well. Like, for example, uh, the difference between wet and dry, or the difference between love and hate. Um, if we're learning things just from individual, you know, like con just learning the word meanings from context, actually things like opposites tend to appear in very like similar contexts. So the fine grained distinctions between words like this, actually you might not be able to capture directly. So another uh, interesting, uh, database that happened around the same time is something called uh, Psych, I believe. That's the pronunciation, right? Yeah, yeah. It's called Psych. And this was a manually curated database uh, attempting to encode all common sense knowledge. Uh, and they were making it for at least 30 years. I think this description of it was about 15 years into the project. So I, I think uh, it was like 1980 to 2010 or something like this. Uh, and it has all these. Yeah. Lennon was actually here for a while. Oh, oh, he was. So uh, Lennon was here at CMU for a while while he was doing this. And what you can see here is it has this kind of hierarchy of uh, things where at the pyramid you have thing. Um, and then you gradually work your way down to like individual, imaginable thing, relations, space, spatial parts, borders, geometry. Um, and uh, social behavior, uh, social relations and culture, language, other things, software, other things like this. So, you know, it's very extensive. It tries to capture common sense about all of these uh, things. Um, one issue with this is that I, I don't think this is a or like a bad idea. I think it's actually a pretty good idea. And there's some more modern, you know, attempts at building databases of common sense. But I think once you start getting into the fine grained uh, semantic details of like social behavior, for example, uh, there's so many different nuances that it becomes rather difficult to do all of this by hand, especially with limited resources. So we end up running into the same uh, you know, issue of something like WordNet, which is that you just run out of people to uh, be building this. And especially, you know, if you're building it, an American person is building it, they might not cover all the nuances of like Indian or Chinese culture or something like that as well. Yeah. There's also this fundamental problem that nobody has solved of shades of meaning. And, you know, they, they tend to be very discreet, like in logic. And that yeah. just doesn't work for everything. Yeah. And uh, what Bob pointed out is there's a fundamental problem of like shades of meaning or, you know, things that aren't true all of the time, but are true most of the time, for example. And I, th I think uh, we're gonna talk more about that in the semantics class also, yeah. So now moving on a little bit closer. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, would, would the knowledge base in tech not be a lot biased towards, uh, towards thoughts of only just one person? Would a knowledge base like psych, uh, so to repeat the question, would a knowledge base like psych uh, be biased towards the thoughts of one person? I, it might not be one person because there are multiple people working on this project, but still it's going to be, 
uh, biased. Interestingly, even learning from data is biased uh, as well. But um, yeah, maybe this would be more biased because you're learning from fewer people. For a while, it's had a fair amount of government funding. So there were a bunch of people working on it for a while. Yeah. And uh, for a while, there were a bunch of people working on, on this project as well. Um, so now uh, going into more modern approaches to knowledge base construction, nonetheless, these are still manually created knowledge bases. Um, a kind of early uh, method for doing this in a more scalable way was extracting data from uh, Wikipedia info boxes. And Wikipedia info boxes, I'm sure everybody's familiar with them. They're this structured data over here that's manually curated by Wikipedia curators. But now instead of dealing with, you know, 20 people being paid by the government to work on psych, now you're dealing with, you know, 20,000 people who are, you know, contributing to Wikipedia just because it's a useful resource. So now this is much more scalable. It's much more broad uh, covering people from different areas across different languages and, and things like that. Um, yeah, and so then this evolved into the wiki data project and the wiki data, data project is pulling in all of this information from Wikipedia info boxes, uh, but it's also uh, curated, you can go in and edit it, you can suggest changes, it also pulls in information from many, many different sources as well. So um, does anyone have a favorite entity that we could look up on Wikidata? Any entity suggestions, something timely? Elon Musk. Elon Musk. I, I knew that was gonna come, but we should we should do it anyway. Okay. So um, Elon Musk, of course, is included in uh, in Wikidata. He's an American business magnet, um, which actually is interesting. I didn't know uh, his citizenship. So I guess maybe his citizenship is, is American. Um, and you can go down uh, sex or gender, uh, country of citizenship, South Africa, Canada, and US. So that tells you he has uh, citizenship, uh, tells you the birth name, given names, family name, date of birth, place of birth, uh, father, mother. And you can uh, also click through to these. So these are uh, relations. Uh, because we have relations, this clicks to another entity in the, uh, in the graph. Um, this also works for long tail entities. So I'd like to think that I'm a long tail entity, uh, but it also has like a little bit of information. Like I got my PhD at Kyoto University in 2012. Um, I'm a human, um, <laughs> which is uh, useful information, you know, a uh, male. Um, my occupation is university teacher, computer scientist, which is appropriate. My field of work is natural language processing. I have no idea where this came from, by the way. I didn't add it myself. Uh, um, what I did add was my doctoral advisor because about like 10 years ago, I added myself to a thing called the Mathematical Genealogy Project where you enter your doctoral advisors and find out your like uh, advising lineage. And apparently it's crawling that and it pulled that data out. Um, so you need to be careful what you post on the internet, basically, because it gets added to Wikidata later. But um, yeah, that's the kind of information that it does. Actually, it's fun to look at the math genealogy of the professors in your classes, because you find out how close they're related to like incredibly famous people. Yeah, so if you look up the professors in your classes, you can see how uh, like closely related they are to famous people like, uh, you know, uh, Turing or <laughs> whatever, whatever else. Maybe not Turing, but uh, well, there's a couple of professors like, here who are like second generation from Turing. Um, yeah, so, so there are some people who are second generation from Turing. Yeah. Where does the data without references come from? Where does the data without references come from? So that's a good question. I I don't know specifically for this, but I'm going to give you some ideas about where it might have come from uh, going forward. So this is a wonderful resource. It's a resource that's very widely used. Um, it actually originally started as a, the Freebase project, um, which was sponsored by Google and Google sponsored it precisely because they wanted something like this for you know, question answering systems or other things like this. Um, sorry, Freebase was started as I think a company and then it was bought by Google. And then uh, Google basically contributed it back as Wikidata because they didn't want to pay to maintain it or something. So. Um, okay, 
So these are just some examples. Of course, there's many, many other knowledge bases. Like, for example, there's uh, medicine-specific knowledge bases, law-specific knowledge bases, other things like that. But I'm not going to cover all of them. Um, so the next topic is uh, learning representations from knowledge bases. And um, one of the major, there's two major reasons why we learn representations from knowledge bases. Uh, the first one is knowledge base incompleteness. Um, and so even with extremely large scale, knowledge bases are kind of by nature incomplete. And for example, in Freebase or Wikidata in 2014, 71% of humans were missing date of birth. Um, this is one example where we're pretty sure that every human has a date of birth. Um, so if 71% of them are missing them, we're pretty sure that 71% is missing data. Um, there are other things where we can't say that, like spouse, because you know some humans don't have a spouse, but um, uh, date of birth, uh, we're pretty sure this is missing. And so one of the reasons why we learn uh, knowledge graph embeddings is so that we can uh, basically fix this problem or alleviate this problem by inferring relations based on uh, knowledge graphs. Um, so what we do uh, to do this is we take advantage of the fact that there's consistency in embedding spaces. And so this is kind of like the analogies that I talked about versus uh, man plus, uh, sorry, king minus man plus woman equals queen. Uh, it's kind of the uh, analogy task where we take into, a, into account uh, the fact that we can um, find a vector that's basically like the, um, the, for example, male to female or masculine to feminine word uh, vector. But instead, we do it for um, other things. Oh, sorry, I actually had that on the slide. So, you know, we can take advantage of this fact to um, basically infer relations from knowledge graphs or infer embeddings uh, of entities from knowledge graphs based on relations. And so the simplest example of this is something called uh, the trans E method for like translate uh, embedding method. And the way it works is we minimize uh, the distance of existing triples with a margin based loss. And so our goal here basically is that we have a, um, a head embedding. So the head embedding might be um, like, let's say we wanted to infer the embedding. Let's say we wanted, we have our Elon Musk embedding. And then we have our just need an interesting person of another nationality. Okay, sure. It's too timely. It's S U N A K, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and so we have our embedding, and then we have our nationality embedding. And um, so here, this would be like either Britain or British. And here, this would be complicated, right? <laughs> so I already, I already came up with a complicated example that I was going to wait like three slides to get into. But um, let, let's say, uh, let's say South African, just because that's what he's most likely. Um, and so, what the H here is is that would be um, like Elon Musk or Rishi Sunak. Um, and then we have uh, the tail entity, which would be South Africa or uh, Britain. And then the uh, the R here, the R vector, would be this uh, nationality. Uh, this nationality vector. And the nationality vector, um, we would add the nationality vector to the head and try to make it close to the tail. And here they uh, use basically a contrastive loss, which says I want the, the addition of the head vector and the relation vector here 
Um, he, they're using L. Uh, I think I got these this equation in this uh, figure from a, a different uh, paper, but like L and R are the same here. And then we add this and we try to make this closer than other pairs that are not in this relation, essentially. Very simple, uh, but nonetheless very effective and, and pretty widely used. So, however, there are some problems with this. Uh, one of the biggest problems with this is that it's not that simple, right? You know, we actually have um, like America or US and Canada. So there's multiple, multiple answers here with respect to nationality. Another problem is that there's also lots of other people who could be um, uh, from the US and they're gonna have different vectors too, right? So um, in order to solve this problem, this is obviously an oversimplification uh, of the actual problem, although maybe a useful one nonetheless, because it's simple, uh, easy to estimate the parameters, other things like that. Uh, any questions? Okay. So there's a bunch of other methods. This is a very popular way of uh, inferring embeddings for knowledge graphs. Um, and there's a bunch of other methods that do this. Um, just to give one other example, a relation extraction with neural tensor networks. Um, the way they do this is basically they, um, they create a model that predicts whether the relation exists or not. And they optimize it so that you basically get a higher score if the relation is likely to exist and a lower score if the relation is not likely to exist. And one way you could do that is you could just take an MLP, concatenate the embeddings of the head and the tail together and make the prediction. Uh, this paper proposes a different way of doing this, which also has um, something they call a neural tensor network, which essentially is the addition of this bilinear term here, where the bilinear term is uh, is taking the original vector and it's multiplying it by a matrix and then multiplying it together with the uh, with the other vector, and that allows you to very easily kind of express other types of relations between the two uh, between the two vectors. Like um, for example, if these two vectors are closer together, they're more likely to be in a relation or something like this. So this model is strictly more expressive than this one, but it's also relatively easy to express kind of some of the reasonable relations that you might have between two embeddings. Um, one issue with this is this model might be a bit over-parameterized. Like if you don't have a whole lot of relations for a particular, um, for, or don't have a whole lot of training examples for a particular relation, then this might not be able to be learned appropriately. One thing I should point out is there's a whole bunch of um, frameworks that allow you to manipulate these embeddings. Um, one, one example is, uh, is this PyKeen framework. Uh, so uh, there's another one, I think it's called let me. Okay. Yeah. Well, so th this PyKeen framework is is one uh, that you can use, and you can use it to download embeddings, etc. Um. Okay. So this is assuming that you have uh, embeddings and uh, you learn embeddings for a uh, knowledge graph, and then you can go on and use those to infer like new relations, for example. So you have embeddings, um, let's say you have the embedding for Rishi Sunak and you know, um, uh, but you want to know next birthplace or something like that. You could follow the birthplace relation and identify, uh, identify which entity was closest to birthplace. And that might be a good uh, guess 
for which uh, for which place he was born. Another option, instead of learning from embeddings, is to try to learn from text directly. And this is a kind of classic information extraction task called relation extraction. And the way it works is you basically um, can do entity recognition over sentences in a, a text and then try to classify when two entities are in a particular relation. And before we talk about specific models that allow you to do this, basically, um, we uh, it, we could first talk about how we create training data to solve this problem. And the way that's most common to create training data for this is instead of like going in and actually annotating data, you can create data using something called distance supervision or weak supervision. And the way this works is you take an entity relation entity triple, and you find all text that matches this and use it to train a predictor. So this is an example. Um, let's say we have uh, Steven Spielberg and Saving Private Ryan. And Steven Spielberg uh, in the relation that we're optimizing for is Steven Spielberg saving uh, creator Saving Private Ryan. And or Steven Spielberg writer Saving Private Ryan. Sorry, actually, let me let me take the final example because that's more clear. Saving uh, Steven Spielberg director Saving Private Ryan. So what you do is you find all sentences that have Steven Spielberg and Saving Private Ryan, and you treat them all as like positive training examples for this relation. So this is good in some cases because now we get Steven Spielberg, we get directed by, and we get Saving Private Ryan. So this is pretty clearly a positive example for uh, learning the like direct director relation, right? However, the top one, Steven Spielberg's film Saving Private Ryan, uh, this is not so clear, right? It doesn't actually indicate that Steven Spielberg is the director. Um, and so because of this, this is maybe indicative, but it's not actually a true positive training example for this relation. So this gives you training data for cheap, but it also you know, has some noise and that handling that noise becomes a problem. So once we have this data, the easiest thing to do is just to do relation classification with neural networks. Um, like most other things in this class, three or four years ago, I would have been talking about all the different architectures that you could use to do this. Now the answer is uh, put it in BERT or DBERTA and it will kind of work. Um, so what you want to do is you want to basically get um, like lexical features of the entities themselves and features of the whole span. Uh, this is an architecture uh, diagram that I had from my older slides, but basically, um, basically what you can do is you can, you know, for example, mark uh, mark the entities that you're talking about in the sentence and then run BERT through it, uh, run it through BERT and predict uh, which relation it is. And that should be, you know, sufficient. So if you have like um, Steven, you could add like special entities like head, Steven Spielberg. Uh, film, and then you have a uh, tail saving private right. And then you just throw the whole sentence into BERT and do the relation classification task. That's the easiest way. There's other ways to do it as well, but um, uh, that's the general idea. It becomes a, a multi, uh, multi label classification task. Um, actually, now, have I talked about multi label versus multi class? I think maybe I did that right at the very beginning, but maybe not. Okay, I guess, um, yeah, there. So multi label and multi class classification, despite the fact that they are very similar, um, are actually different things or traditionally refer to different things. Um, and anybody 
know the answer? Yeah. Uh, with multi label, a single instance can be labeled as multiple class tags, but in multi class, a single instance can be labeled as only a single class, but there are multiple options. Yeah, exactly. So um, to repeat the answer, basically, um, in a multi class classification task, this is what you guys have been handling mostly this time. Uh, each, the answer is a one hot vector. So you have a single true label, and all the other labels are false. For multi-label classification, you could have different answers be correct. So for this one, you need to use the sigmoid function. Uh, sorry, for this one, you need to use the softmax function on the output side because the softmax function picks a single you know, label. Here, you could use the sigmoid function on the output side because it would allow you to classify multiple labels is, is correct. In relation extraction, um, a relation classification is a multi-label classification problem because a single sentence can indicate multiple uh, multiple relations. So like Steven Spielberg is the writer and director of Saving Private Ryan would indicate writer is true and director is true. So. Okay. Um, so next, I'd like to talk about um, modeling distance supervision noise in neural models. And this is a paper that I really like. I feel like it. I, I in, introduced it every single time in my class, uh, but it, it's not as widely appreciated as I think it should be. But basically, um, one of the major issues that we have in distant supervision uh, with for relation extraction is that there's noise in the distant supervision labels. And the way they handle it here is they essentially model this di distant supervision noise. And the way they do this is they have their encoder, whatever type of encoder you want, say BERT or, or uh, you know, Diverta, whatever. You get embeddings from this. And then from the embeddings, you both make a prediction and you predict a transition matrix of the prediction, which you use as your final um, observed distribution. And so basically the idea is you have your probability predicted by your model. And then you might have this confusion matrix where it's like 0 0.8, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.7, 0 0.1. Um, which basically converts the predictions into something that are uh, like noised, essentially noise predictions. It spreads out the um, the output. Um, if people are familiar with label smoothing, label smoothing is kind of like this, but it has a fixed uh, transition matrix where they're learning uh, they're learning this transition matrix on the fly. And one important thing is they also have a small amount of like clean data, maybe manually uh, annotated data, where they fix this transition matrix to one. So uh, the idea being that um, on the clean data, you get a predicted distribution that you're very confident about. So you're not making any adjustments to it. And then on the noisy data, um, you uh, ensure that the transition matrix, or you allow the transition matrix to be uh, more free. So I, I think this is a neat idea um, that was mostly trained on or tested on relation extraction, but uh, I, I think it could be applicable to other varieties of noisy data as well. Cool. Um, any, any questions about these things? Okay, next. So uh, using knowledge bases to inform neural models. I think this is a really cool uh, idea. And one thing that, one kind of criticism that people might level at the use of structured knowledge bases right now is that, you know, hey, we have all the text on the internet. We can learn all of the knowledge that we need from text on the internet. So there is little reason to go out of your way and use a structured knowledge base. 
Uh, however, I think one one interesting thing is that knowledge bases are kind of like oversimplifications of the world. So they they take a very complex, you know, a very complex world and distill it down into something like less complex. So uh, to give an example, um, you know, Elon Musk's page might have said he had three varieties of citizenship, but it might not have said exactly when he acquired those varieties of citizenship or, um, you know, through what means he did that or other things like that. And all of this stuff would be included in text. Um, however, knowledge graph embeddings are very good at capturing or any any sort of discrete knowledge base tends to be very good at capturing very long tailed distributions that you observe very rarely online. Like, for example, um, I don't know if my advisor's name was written many places online other than Wikipedia or um, like where particular people were born. Or just to give another example from multilingual NLP, it's much easier to get a dictionary in very low resource languages than it is to get parallel text in very low resource languages. So there's all kinds of things where you can get like structured knowledge that covers the long tail much better than you can get uh, large amounts of text. So taking advantage of this, um, there's a number of methods that incorporate knowledge from uh, structured knowledge bases like lexicons into the training of neural models. And this particular paper on retrofitting embeddings to existing lexicons, it works on word embeddings. And the way it works is you do a post hoc transformation of the word embeddings to better match the lexicon. And so the way it works is you first pre-train uh, word embeddings uh, using word to vec or whatever other uh, method that you would like. And then you have a double objective of making transformed embeddings close to neighbors and close to the original embedding. And so uh, this equation is a little bit small here, but basically the uh, QI is the, let me make sure I get this right. So um, Q hat I is an original embedding and QI is a, um, is the adjusted embedding after training. And then this E here is like a synonym set. It's a set of synonyms uh, of things that you know are similar. Another thing it could be if you're talking about a bigger knowledge base like Wikidata is a set of um, entity names that you know refer to the same entity some of the time. So that would be another example. And so the thing on the left here is basically saying, don't move away very far from your original embedding. And then the thing on the right is saying, but try to group together things that we know are synonyms. So uh, this is a very clean and uh, simple way of doing this. Um, this can also be used to force antonyms away from each other. So this might be even more important because as I mentioned, you know, antonyms tend to occur in very similar contexts, despite the fact that they mean uh, very different things. So that's, uh, that's another example. Um, another, yeah. In the previous slide, how do you know like what in the lexicon, what are the synonyms? Like I'm guessing if, if it's from the context, then it, that knowledge would have already been in the embedding. So what extra information are we giving? This? Yeah, so sorry, I, I should have been much more clear on this. So this is coming from something like WordNet or a dictionary or something like that. So it's something that's been human curated, yeah. Um, the, this, uh, this set of synonyms is coming from like WordNet or a dictionary. Um, and that's the important thing here. Like if it was just relying on embeddings, then it'd be a chicken and egg problem, right? You need good embeddings to find the synonyms. You need uh, good synonyms to learn the embeddings. So another uh, thing that you can do is you can take knowledge and inject it in uh, language models. And there's a number of different ways you can do this. This example is uh, from one of my papers that I did, but there's other uh, similar examples. And basically uh, what this paper does is it, um, it, give, it provides some topical knowledge uh, that you could be using to uh, kind of bias 
the model to discuss certain topics. And specifically, we use this for like generating articles from Wikipedia. And what we did was essentially we added each relation name is an extra item in our vocabulary when learning a language model. And so we have this topical entity like here, this was from several years ago where we were still using uh, like Barack Obama is our stereotypical example. Um, but, you know, Barack Obama has um, various Various relations like birth name, uh, birth date, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And each of these things also have uh, aliases, for example. So, like birth date, uh, you could write it in different ways. You could write it in like August 4th, uh, 1961, or, or other things like this. And basically uh, we created a model that in addition to predicting the next word in the sequence, like a language model normally does, like uh, Barack uh, predicting the word Barack, it can also predict the relations like birth name or given name. And by doing this, uh, it can you know output with confidence. For example, if we know that uh, Barack Obama is the topic of a Wikipedia article, uh, by outputting birth name, we know it will get the birth name of the top, you know, yeah. The topic correct as opposed to, um, you know, making up facts about uh, entities, which language models, you know, often like to do. So, um, like the way this is actually implemented is we have our normal vo vocabulary. So we have, you know, the uh, somewhere down there, you have like Barack and things like this. But in addition, we just add a small amount of vocabulary, like birth name, name, et cetera. Um, now, the difficulty in doing this is uh, twofold. Uh, now, the first problem that we have is that now there's multiple correct answers um, for how you could generate the sequence. You could either generate birth name or you could generate word by word, right? Um, the other difficulty is that birth name actually is four tokens. So um, in order to generate all of these four tokens at the same time, uh, or generate hand, like all of these four tokens at the same time, then you have uh, essentially uh, have to consider the fact that the granularity of birth name is like rougher than the granularity of uh, these four words. And so we used an algorithm that basically does dynamic programming. It does this like, a search through the sequence in order to be able to generate, uh, like calculate the probability of generating the, the sequence appropriately. So I, I kind of like this, this shows a way that you could incorporate kind of like factual constraints into, uh, into a model, into a language model. Um, any questions about this? Yeah. I'm not very clear on how the copyable graph works. So like, how is it learning to copy it? Yeah, so um, the way the graph works is right now, th there's more complicated things you could do here, but right now we were working on generating Wikipedia articles. So we know the topic of the Wikipedia article and we can get the Wikidata entry for the topic of the Wikipedia article and create this graph mm -hmm. where the graph has a single central node and then it has a whole bunch of relations coming off of it. <clears throat> and then um, when we actually are generating the next word, we predict either the next word or one of the relation tags, um, where one of the relation tags is one of the kind of edges coming off of this central node. And then if we predict one of the relation tags, instead of outputting the relation tag itself, we output the tail of that relation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. If I'm generating text after that, mm -hmm. do I give it the tag or do I give it the like its actual value? 
Very, very, very good question. So if we're generating text after this, do we give it the tag uh, like as input to the encoder? I assume you're talking about that, right? So there, there would be two options. We could either feed in birth name or we could feed in um, each of the words. In this case, we chose to feed in each of the words. And the reason why we chose to do that is because um, like transformer models, for example, BERT, are very, very fast at calculating, um, at calculating the encodings of sequences if they don't depend on the predictions. If they do depend on the predictions, it's, very, it's relatively slow to calculate transformer models because they can't be parallelized. Um, so in order to handle that, basically we just, um, we ignored the, which tag was predicted and we just uh, fed in the words and used the words to make the prediction. There might be a, you know, a tricky or a slow way that would allow you to feed in the tags, but yeah. Uh, yes. Um, to generate this text, uh, you would have been using a decoder type model. Yes. Like too. So, uh, like you mentioned BERT in that example, so that's why I got a bit confused. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I we would not be using BERT. You're you're right. We would be using a left to right model. I just mentioned BERT because that's what you implemented in assignment one. But um, yeah, it, no, it, it would be a left to left to right model like GPT two. Yeah. Cool. Um, so another uh, another piece of work. This is another thing that I, I worked on before, which I I kind of. Uh, find interesting is there's, um, as I mentioned, there's kind of a connection between knowledge or knowledge bases and text corpora give you different things. Um, knowledge bases can be robust. They can handle long tail phenomena better than text corpora. However, text corpora do contain a whole lot of things that aren't included in knowledge bases uh, because knowledge bases are inherently incomplete. And also, you know, text corpora can handle nuance and other things like this. So in this work here, what we did was we, um, we basically created a textual knowledge base. And um, the, the figure here is a little bit complicated because the method also is a little bit uh, tricky. But the way it works is essentially we get a question like when when was the Grateful Dead and Bob Dylan album released? Uh, we encode the query and then we identify parts in the corpus that match with the um, uh, that match to the question, and it finds a whole bunch of. Um, it finds a whole bunch of contexts that kind of match together with the question. And so then the first thing it will do is it would maybe find uh, an album that was released by the Grateful Dead and Bob Dylan. So it would be like Grateful Dead, Bob Dylan album. And it would identify, uh, it, it would find entities that kind of match this relation in embedding space by looking up uh, over all of the text in Wikipedia um, based on kind of dense retrieval methods, uh, like we talked about before. So we encode all of Wikipedia, we encode a vector for this question, and we try to find the best match in Wikipedia for, uh, for this vector. But it can also do uh, multi-hop reasoning uh, by basically taking the answer to this and then going back and uh, encoding it again, uh, encoding the question in this answer again, and then, um, than doing another lookup over Wikipedia. So this is kind of a uh, a way to do multi-hop reasoning in embedding space over a textual knowledge base as opposed to a um, as opposed to a like structured knowledge base, uh, discrete knowledge base. So if that sounds interesting, you can take a look at this paper too. Okay. Um, so up until now, I've been talking a lot about um, knowledge bases that have entities and entities and relations between them. And up until now, I've been talking about like birth, uh, birthplace or birth date, 
these kind of like named relations that actually have a, a real meaning that we uh, can think about here. But one problem with this is that this limits you to only handling the relations that you already knew a priori uh, and are existed in your knowledge exist in your knowledge base. And again, there are new relations that come out all of the time. They come out all of the time. So just to give an example, can anybody think, or before I give an example, any person have an idea of a relation that might have come about in the past couple couple years or five years or something like that that didn't exist before but might be very might might be very useful if you wanted a QA system or something uh covid covid symptom i uh <laughs> i have on the meeting chat that i that is interesting. I don't know if that's necessarily a new relation, though, because I think there the head entity would be COVID and the the relation would be symptoms. So that might be an existing relation. But uh, any other ideas? New entities are easy. You know, every time somebody's born, you have a new entity. But what about a new relation? Any oh I, here's an here's an interesting one preferred pronouns that's a pretty that's a pretty good one I don't know if that's in the past five years or not but it's one that certainly became very prominent in the past five years and now is you know all over the web I was thinking about something a little bit more uh, more mundane or simple than that. that that's better than my example actually uh, any other ideas. Like let's say let's say you're building a site. The one I was thinking of is like TikTok channel or something like that. You know, um, which is very important, right? Because if you're building a profile for a user or an influencer or something, you'll want their you'll want their channel. Um, another way you might be able to think about that is like a ternary relation, where it's like person site person social media site channel or something like that but if we're going to treat it as a binary relation then you would uh, you would need a new one every time a new social media site comes up so uh, the thing that uh, basically solves this for us is something called open information extraction and open information extraction here the basic idea is that the text is the relation and so uh, if we take a sentence, uh, United has a hub in Chicago, which is the headquarters of uh, United Continental Holdings. Uh, this would extract something like United has a hub in as the relation and Chicago. And Chicago is the headquarters of United Continental Holdings. So basically what you do is you identify um, entities and you identify the text between the entities. So um, this can extract any variety of relation uh, because you know anything that's expressed in text you can extract in this way. Uh, but the issue is that this doesn't abstract. So uh, for example, you could have United has a hub in uh, Chicago or Sh Chicago, uh, sorry, United has three hubs in Chicago, uh, you know, Dallas and something else. and then the relation would be has three hubs in. Um, and then there's all kinds of other, uh, you know, other types of ways that you could say the same information. So for open information extraction, one of the original kind of goals of doing this was to uh, run it over the entire web. And, you know, when this uh, first came out in 2007, it was still kind of a new thing to run, you know, run your models over all of the information on the web. So in order to do this, they basically uh, came up with very simple rule-based methods that were very fast. So um, the way they normally work is you use a parser to extract uh, data or to do syntactic analysis, like we're going to be talking about in a few classes. And then we extract them according to rules. Uh, some rules being things like each uh, relation must contain a predicate, um, in the subject and object must be noun phrases. Um, and then they further, they went further and even went to train a fast model to extract these over large amounts of data, data without doing parsing because parsing was thought to be too slow at the time. 
Um, and uh, then one important thing is they aggregate multiple pieces of evidence. So basically, uh, they try to find these mentions that are very common. And uh, things that are very common are more likely to be reliable, right? And so they uh, extract uh, the more common and reliable pieces of data in favor of the other ones. There's also uh, neural models for open information extraction. And um, so unfortunately, heuristics are still not perfect. Um, one, uh, are still not perfect. They extract things that aren't actually relations. Like um, just to give an example, uh, said, uh, like, or told is, a, is an example of a relation. So you have like, um, Graham told Graham told the class or something like that. And that's not actually a relation, right? It's kind of like not useful information that you'd want to store in a database. So that should be excluded according to, you know, a human evaluation of whether this is useful uh, or not, but um, it, it would be included according to the heuristics. And so one very interesting method for solving this, which I think also can be used for other varieties of annotation tasks as well, is they basically, um, this work here basically tried to create data by asking crowd workers questions. And uh, for example, uh, they would ask questions like, who finished something? What did someone finish? What did someone finish something as? How did someone finish something? And then by looking at the sentence and answering these questions, they basically create training data for a number of different semantic relations, including kind of like um, open IE style uh, relations as well. And there is a nice data set called the QA SRL data set that does this for uh, semantic role labeling. Uh, and so if you're kind of interested in naturalistic annotation, figuring out how to encourage crowd workers to uh, answer questions for you, this would be a nice uh, paper to take a look at. The nice thing about it is you don't need people, like this is relatively easy even for unskilled people to do or people who weren't trained in linguistics. And so if you wanted to do it for like a new domain or a new language or something like that, it's a pretty feasible way of doing so. Yeah. In these cases, um, we are uh, we've created the question or the question bank related to each verb that mm -hmm. we find. Or uh, is it that are we generating these questions, or is it possible to generate these questions on the fly, like as we encounter new verbs? So these questions are related to particular semantic relations, and. Um, to be honest, I read the paper a while ago, so I don't remember exactly how they applied each one to each, but I imagine some are applicable or not applicable in certain cases. And just to give an, like the most obvious example, um, some of these are not gonna be applicable unless the verb is transitive. So you can't, you can't ask for the object of an intransitive verb. So um, obviously some of these are, uh, are applicable. And I think they would probably depend on which semantic roles the verb could take in the first place. Uh, but yeah, I'd say read the paper for the details of that. I don't want to say something just wrong. Okay. So uh, another interesting thing is you can um, further like learn relations from relations. And um, so if we think about modeling uh, word embeddings versus modeling relations, um, word embeddings give information um, uh, of the word in context, which is, in, or maybe the entity in context, which can be indicative of KB uh, traits. Another thing is that um, other relations or combinations of them can be indicative of whether a relation exists or not. And uh, this can be considered a link prediction problem in graphs. So can anybody think of a of an example where we have three entities where entity one and two are in a relation and entity two and three are in a relation and that indicates a relation of entity one and three. Kind of a transitive relation or something, if you will. Family tree name. 
Yeah, family tree. So the, that's uh, the obvious one. So um, specifically, you know, child and child indicates grandchild. So, um, and, and that one's like nearly 100% correct. Um, so there's uh, one original, a uh, very early paper on doing this, uh, which is still used in a lot of uh, things today, framed this as a ten tensor decomposition problem. Um, it's also what Ilya Sutskever was doing before he was training GPT-3 apparently. But um, uh, so then uh, we have, uh, we can model relations by decomposing a tensor uh, containing entity relation entity tuples. And so we, um, we basically will have a whole bunch of entities um, a whole bunch of a whole bunch of like head entities, a whole bunch of tail entities, and uh, then whether a relation exists between them in a tensor. And so this big tensor will be full of like it will be full of like ones and zeros in various places, depending on whether. Um, whether a relation, a particular relation exists between two entities. And then what you do is you essentially take this, you reduce the rank of the tensor, which basically tries to express the tensor in a much smaller, is a much smaller tensor. And then you expand the rank again. And after you do that, um, essentially what that will do is that will allow you to predict the missing values in this tensor and predict which, um, you know, which relations probably exist despite the fact that they didn't exist in the original tensor. So uh, that's one way of doing things. This is also widely used in recommender systems, like, you know, recommending your next books to read on Amazon or your next movies on, on Netflix or um, whatever. So Another interesting uh, paper is matrix factorization to reconcile schema-based and open IE extraction. So we think about Wikidata, and then we think about open IE extractions. And so what do we do when we have a knowledge base and text from the web that we're both used to ex uh, extract these? And uh, this in this paper is called a universal schema. And what we do is we embed relations from multiple schema in the same place. So we basically have um, we have relations from, for example, Wikidata, which is like X professor at Y, X historian at Y, or maybe like, let's say this is, um, sorry, no, I, I apologize. These are, um, these are the open IE extractions, which are like X professor at Y, X historian at Y. And then within Freebase or Wikidata, we have employee. Within another knowledge base, we have the member relation. And so, um, this also gives us a large incomplete tensor, and we can use a similar tensor decomposition algorithm to basically reduce the rank of the tensor, increase the rank of the tensor, and allow us to predict, you know, missing knowledge uh, knowledge graph relations based on the fact that maybe they exist in open I, uh, in the open IE extractions, but they don't exist in the original uh, database here. Okay, um, so another thing is, uh, this is uh, talking about like just expressing everything as a tensor, but I also talked about like transitive relations. So it's like, um, you know, child and child becomes, uh, becomes grandchild. And so multi-step paths can be informative for indicating individual relations. Uh, so this is a nice paper that discusses uh, this prediction. In the example they use is something very like, I don't know, near and dear to our hearts research papers. And uh, so what they do is they extract different paths, and they get uh, they also measure a weighting over paths that indicate um, that indicate which path indicates that a particular thing would be a um, uh, particular re relation would hold. And so basically uh, what this here is doing is it's saying, I have particular features of a paper and I would like to decide which paper to publish, publish the journal in. 
And so what they do is in, they want to infer basically the, the paper, paper to journal uh, like relation, which is a one-step relation, right? Paper will be published in journal. But in order to do so, they find a whole bunch of other paths that are basically indicative or correlated with the fact that a paper is published in a journal. So to give an example, if there's a word in the title of the paper, um, if there's a word uh, in the title of the current paper that's also in the title of another paper, and that paper is published in a journal, that's indicative that the paper will be published in the journal. Another thing is um, there's another paper with that word in the title where the first author is also the first author of another paper and that's published in a journal. And so basically what they do is they extract all of these paths and they train a model that is essentially a logistic re regression model that tries to predict whether um, you know a particular path is indicative of another path. Um, any questions here? Okay. Um, so this is a follow-up paper to the paper that I talked about before. And basically uh, what this does is this considers whole paths in a differentiable framework. So basically they, um, uh, they the most, um, like the simplest way of explaining this is here. And basically what they do is they have a big um, matrix of relation weights that tell you whether um, whether a particular relation, following a particular relation is indicative of a particular uh, other relation existing. So this is like has office in city, um, city and country indicates has office in country. And they multiply this relation together multiple times based on the, um, uh, based on like, so you have like one relation for has office in city, you have another relation for has office in country. And by doing it this way, they make it so that you can optimize this end to end because this is just doing matrix multiplications, right? And so we do these multiple matrix multiplications, we calculate a score, we calculate the probability given that score, and then we back prop through all of these multiplications. And that allows us to learn the weights of these kind of logic rules about uh, whether something exists or not, whether a relation exists or not. Okay, um, so the final thing that I'd like to talk about today is uh, methods for probing uh, for knowledge in language models. And so traditional um, question answering or machine reading and comprehension models uh, usually refer to external resources to answer questions. And so then a, one question that we'd like to ask is how uh, language models pre-trained on large text corpora already uh, capture this variety of knowledge. And um, one kind of seminal work in this area was um, this language models is knowledge bases paper, which also kind of was the first paper on modern prompting techniques. And basically what they did was they used, um, instead of using structured queries to query a knowledge base, um, actually, I realized I, I should have, sorry, I should have talked about this, but I, I didn't. Um, I, I'm sure most people know uh, S, uh, SQL or SQL, uh, which is used for querying database tables. There's a very similar thing. Um, uh, called Sparkle, uh, which is used for querying knowledge bases. So, um, if you're going to be querying something like Wikidata, you'll be using a Sparkle query, like uh, like you use the SQL queries here. So basically um, structured queries like Sparkle are used to query knowledge bases um, and they look a little bit like Dante born in X, um, but natural language prompts can also be used to query LMs like Dante was born in uh, mask here. Um, and uh, basically what they found is that Manual prompts uh, for 41 relations could, uh, with BERT, could give you 31% accuracy. Of course, now uh, with our bigger and stronger language models, the numbers are much higher. Um, 
One interesting thing, um, we uh, we did a paper where we followed up on this paper and we created uh, prompts in many different languages, uh, you know, from English, French, and Dutch uh, being on the higher end to Yoruba in Ilocano um, on the lower end. And one interesting thing about this is you can see that the uh, the accuracy of the language model in solving these queries uh, decreases greatly as we use other languages. Um, however, one thing to think about is like, why is this the case, right? It might seem obvious, but then if you think about it a little bit more, it's a little bit less obvious because the fact that the model can do reasonably well on English actually indicates that whatever knowledge there is about these entities exists somewhere in the model. It's just that the Yoruba, when you ask the question in Yoruba or Ilocano, the model is not able to retrieve that knowledge appropriately, right? Because if you ask the same question in English, you got a better score. So I think that has like relatively interesting, you know, implications for uh, kind of knowledge retrieval in general. And recently there's been a lot of work on prompt engineering and maybe this is a variety of prompt engineering in some way. Um, so there's also uh, kind of closed book uh, question answering problems and closed book question answering problems. What they do is they generate answers to questions uh, without any additional context. And um, I, I would I would skip this second sentence. Uh, this is probably kind of out of date information. Most of the time, retrieval based models beat uh, uh, beat these uh, like closed book models. But basically, what this uh, this and follow up work has shown is that null language models can serve as knowledge bases even for more complex questions. Like um, you know. Uh, both knowledge based questions and um, and other varieties of questions about common sense or other things. Um, and I talked about this one uh, last time, so I'll skip over that. Another uh, interesting thing is about multi hop uh, factual reasoning in language models. And um, this is a examination that we did recently on multi-hop factual reasoning in language models where we comp compared uh, both open book language models that have access to retrieval and closed book language models that have access to, um, that don't have access to retrieved information. And um, so, Basically, we, we have questions like return the artist who recorded party ain't over, um, or sorry, which in which part of Georgia does the artist that recorded party ain't over live? It would be the multi hop question. And then, you know, basically the way this works is through uh, return the artist who recorded the party ain't over, where in Georgia does uh, Usher live because Usher is that artist. And um, we tried it with both closed book and open book QA models. And one interesting thing that we found essentially is that the results are kind of counterintuitive. It's not, the, the answers are not super well correlated with the fact that like it, the model is able to answer both constituent questions correctly. So the way you interpret this graph is on the right side, it's if the model is able to answer both questions correctly, uh, then this one is if it's able to answer the first question correctly only um, uh, first of these Q1 and Q2 up here. This one over here is if it's able to answer only the second one. And this one over here is if it's able to answer uh, neither of them. And then blue means that the multi-hop question was answered correctly. So um, one interesting thing to see is that um, it's almost as indicative of whether you get the multi-hop question correct if you're able to answer only the second question correct as it is if you are able to answer like both questions correct. Sure, both qu questions is a bit better, but um, uh, but basically like just being able to answer the second one is enough. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I think this is an interesting question. And actually maybe 
you can see why that would be the case. Which part of Georgia does the artist recorded Party Ain't Overlive? Even if I have no idea who the artist who recorded Party Ain't Over is, I could say Atlanta, and that probably wouldn't be a very bad guess, right? Because Atlanta is the biggest city in Georgia. So, um, so it's a kind of interesting thing, especially as people are thinking about uh, doing more complex questions. Um, one thing I should point out is we actually did this um, uh, before the uh, the work on like let's uh, let's think step by step. I, I talked about that in the prompting lecture, I think, um, and so. Let's see if this works with Bloom. Oh, I'll, I'll put this to the test. I actually haven't tried it before. So um, in which city in Georgia does the artist who recorded party over? Recorded. Who recorded? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> those are those are cities in Georgia, but it's the wrong Georgia. So, <laughs> and uh, also it gave me multiple choices. Um, no, let's try. Let's think. Step by step. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I could try that too, sure. <laughs> yes, it didn't. Uh, I guess it didn't know that. Um, I'll give it one more chance. <laughs> okay, kind of give up now. Uh, Okay, so I guess I guess uh, Google wasn't able to do that either. So we still have some uh, we still have some work. That being said, I'm not sure if that many people ask that question. So um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, yeah, that's all I have. Uh, all I have for today. Are there any questions, discussion, other things like that before we wrap up? Okay, I don't see any. So I guess uh, talk to everyone later. Happy to discuss more up here.